for centuries a series of mighty and wise kings transformed Egypt into the greatest civilization in the Mediterranean world. While the ancestors of the Greeks founded their first villages and the Romans still were nursed by wolves, Egyptians already built the pyramids. However, the myth of Icarus teaches that the one who comes too close to the sun must fall. And the twilight of Egyptian civilization was coming. But before the end, one man will try to delay the inevitable. Pepe the second. As always, it is very complicated to know the events that ended a dynasty. Unas was the last king of the fifth, and his reign was not very glorious. We don't know the reasons, but Egypt experienced a period of economic turmoil. Some evidence indicates that his reign was also afflicted by famine, and above all that, the Egyptian army had to face the Shasus, Bedouins from Palestine. However, Una's legacy is not as dire as some argue. Egypt was able to maintain diplomatic and trade relations with distant kingdoms, and the king was even able to build a pyramid, even though it was the smallest from those built in the old kingdom. Una's diet without having a son to inherit the throne. But nothing seems to indicate that Egypt experienced a period of civil war after the end of the Fifth Dynasty. Another important detail about Una's reign is that it was in this period that the cult of the god Osiris exploded in popularity. The king had already lost his place as the center of the universe for the god Ra. However, his coat was still linked to the royal family because the king is the son of Ra. And most of Egyptians believed that only the king had the power to open the gates of eternity for his people. To get to paradise, you must be loyal to the king and nothing else. But According to the cult of Osiris, each individual was solely responsible for his fate after death. The king has just lost his absolute power in religious affairs. The sixth dynasty will begin with Teti I. We don't know his origins, but he did not have a royal blood, because he had to marry the daughter of Unas, Princess Iput legitimize his presence in the throne. Coming to power thanks to his wife, Teti will try to use marriage to gain influence. He will marry his many daughters with the most powerful families in Egypt to try to keep them under control. Although this habit is not new, it is the systematic aspect of Teti's strategy that surprised us. All her daughters were married from a very young age. His strategy was not a total success. The nomarchs continued to become more and more independent and began to build tombs in their lands 
far from the capital. And despite his efforts to legitimize himself, Teti will be assassinated. The only sources that tell us about the assassination of Teti are the texts of Manetton. According to him, the king was killed by members of his personal guard. Alas, Manetton did not tell us why he was killed, and we have no strong evidence to prove his claims. After all, Manetton lived centuries after the age of Teti. But many historians assume that he is telling the truth, because the king was buried before his pyramid was finalized. After the sudden death of Teti, the throne will be assumed by the mysterious Uzer Kara, of whom we know nothing except a very short reign of two years. Some have claimed that he was an usurper who have been responsible for the death of the former king. And then, two years later, he was finally deposed. However, the fact that his name is present in the royal lists indicates that for his contemporaries he was considered a true and legitimate king. The Egyptologist Nicolas Grimal offers a theory that I personally find the most plausible. Uzer Kara was a regent who assumed power while the young prince Pep I was still too young to take the throne. The long reign of Pep I seems to indicate that he ascended to the throne at a very young age. Pepe will try to reuse his father's marriage strategy. However, instead of marrying his children, he will marry himself. We know that he married at least eight times, and it is possible that he had other wives whose names were erased from history. But once again, this strategy had disappointing results. Even if the king succeeded in re-establishing the Egyptian economy and he sent numerous expeditions to conquer Nubia, the wealth brought by his military victories made the nomarchs even richer and therefore more powerful. The reign of Pepi will also be no thanks to a conspiracy in the royal harem. In his tomb, Uni, a senior official, describes how he was summoned to accompany the judgment of one woman who tried to kill the prince heir to the throne. Uni did not tell us who was she, but he let clear that he was a woman of great influence and power. Now, this kind of conspiracy should have been common at the time, but the fact that a man without noble blood was invited to participate in this judgment and in addition had the courage to write the event in his tomb show us how much the respect towards the king had fallen. After his death, it is his son Menre Rat I will become the king. Alas, he does not seem to be interested in creating the political reforms that his kingdom needs so much. Rather, he prefers to follow the steps of his father. Military expeditions are once again sent to the land of Nubia, and although they were met with success, this did not bring much help in re-establishing royal authority. During his reign, some nomarchs will even begin to receive a funeral coat, one of the greatest privileges of the royal family. The reign of Men the I will not last long. After 10 years, the king will find his death, and once again it is a young child who will assume the throne. The time has come for Pepe II to be part of history. 
According to Manhattan and the Egyptian tradition, Pepi would have reigned for 18 years, which makes his reign the longest in human history. However, most historians believe that his length is exaggerated, and Pepi would not reign for more than 60 years. It is his mother, Aken Sen Pepi II, who was soon the regency during his childhood. She seems to have been assisted by her brother Dijau, vizier of the former king. The start of Pepi II's reign seems to have been calm. After two generations, the military campaigns in Nubia finally benefited the royal family by opening new trade routes to the south and the heart of Africa. A glimpse into the personality of the young monarch can be found in a letter that he wrote to Hirkuf, governor of Aswan and leader of an expedition to Nubia. During his travels to trade and retrieve ivory, ebony and other valuable goods, he captured a dwarf. The news arrives at the court, and the enthusiastic king sent Hirkuf a letter, promise him a great reward if he manages to bring the dwarf back alive. Pepi II will keep his fascination with distant kingdoms for the rest of his life. As an adult, he financed numerous explorations and trade expeditions. However, he's not going to abandon the military policies of his ancestors. Nubia will continue to be colonized and the king will have an intense military life because many nomadic tribes will try to invade the borders. Finally, Pepi II will try to create reforms to restore royal power. The post of vizier will be divided in two. Each half of the kingdom will have an administrator chosen personally by the king. As the viziers were the members of administration the closest to the pharaoh, Pepi will increase his responsibilities and influence. And to appease the nomarchs and gain their confidence, the king will begin a dangerous policy of offering gifts and privileges, such as not paying taxes for his most loyal servants. This, of course, increased their loyalty and motivated the nomarchs to buy the king. Alas, this strategy only works when you still have riches to offer. But for a few years, Pepi's reforms succeeded in preserving the stability of the kingdom. Alas, when the king reached an advanced age, he was unable to put an end to new crises which afflicted his kingdom. The Bedouin invasions increased, the treasury was empty because the administration was unable to collect taxes, and the nomarchs no longer respected the will of the king. When Merenrat II ascended to the throne, the kingdom was in a total state of crisis. If we believe in Herodotus' accounts, he would have reigned only for one year before being murdered by his own people. After his wife would take the throne, the mysterious Nicotris. Until today, many historians still debate whether Nicotris existed or not. The only trace that we have of her are the texts of Herodotus. And although he claims that they are based on testimonials of Egyptian priests, he also says that she was blonde with rosy cheeks, which is very unlikely, and that she would have built the third pyramid of Giza. Some Egyptologists claim that we can find her name in the royal list of Turin. However, the power reliability makes it difficult 
to prove this theory, and other historians claim that they assume the name is just a title for another king. If the legends are true, she was braver than any man and more beautiful as any woman. Nicotris was able to avenge her husband before committing suicide. With she, we finally come to the end of the Old Kingdom. According to the Turin Papyrus, four other kings existed in the Sixth Dynasty. But their reigns lasted one, two, four and two years respectively, and nothing has remained of them except their names. An age of chaos has just begun. And for a long time, Set, God of Storm, was the only to rule over Ashen. But even with this chaotic end, this period will be forever remembered with nostalgia by the Egyptians. For then, it was a golden age, when mighty kings were able to build monuments beyond imagination, and wise wrote texts that have served as inspiration for centuries.